Good morning, everyone, for day two of the SAT CPI meeting. So for the first session, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's uh, keynote speaker. It's Matthew Green from Johns Hopkins University. He's a cryptographer and <clears throat> security researcher. He's an associate professor of computer science, and he specializes in applied cryptography, privacy-enhanced information storage systems, <clears throat> and anonymous cryptocurrencies. He's a member of the teams uh, that developed the zero-coin anonymous uh, cryptocurrency and Zcash. And then he's also been involved in uh, a lot of high-profile work in identifying vulnerabilities, such as TLS, Apple iMessage, and the SpeedPass. Uh, Matthew is also a co-author of the paper Keys Under Doormats that argues against universal encryption backdoors. In today's talk, Matthew is going to talk about building trust in an untrustworthy world. Matthew, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry to get you all out of bed at uh, 8.30 in the morning, but I appreciate you coming. Um, I am going to talk today about some work that I've done recently with a few people who are in this room, uh, looking at the security of crypto systems and cryptographic devices under a kind of a different threat model than we're usually, um, we tend to think about these things. Um, just to sort of extend on that really very nice intro that Suzanne just gave me, I consider myself a researcher who focuses mostly on privacy preserving cryptography and, and applied crypto in that setting, who occasionally bumbles into problems that have to do with actual applied problems like TLS. Um, Nick, I think, gave a really good introduction to what a lot of those TLS problems look like yesterday during his keynote. Uh, you're probably familiar with a bunch of the things that are on this screen right now. I, I had the privilege of being involved in either helping to discover or disclose one or two of these things. Um, we had this, uh, this really interesting talk yesterday about impact, and uh, all the folks who were up here on the panel, uh, including Patrick, were talking about, you know, found a company that's got, you know, 300 employees, and that sounds really impressive. But I want to suggest an alternative way that you can have impact. And I'm going to show you what I did. Back in 2012, I founded what I think is probably the most influential Twitter account uh, on the entire platform, which was called OpenSSL Fact. And what, what it did, starting in 2012, was it resolved to uh, tweet one terrible line of OpenSSL code every day until the madness ends. And I'm not going to say that like, I'm fully personally responsible for OpenSSL getting better. But I will point out that in 2014, like, it did get a lot better, and there was a huge investment in making things, things improve. Um, but the end result of this is I wound up kind of being in the right place at the right time to see a lot of different TLS bugs and kind of see how the internet deals with resolving these different things. But these aren't really what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about a different class of attacks that are much scarier. And those attacks can be summarized in this slide, which is not the most famous slide from the Snowden revelations. But I think it's the most important slide. It's my, uh, my favorite slide in the sense that it shows us how people view our world from the other side, right? We, we are all here spending all of this money and all of this time trying to improve computer security. This is a GCHQ slide. This is Britain's NSA, where they talk about the response to improving security. Improving security, it's actually happening. We're doing our job. We're succeeding. And this is a problem and they want to do something about it. Unfortunately, it seems like they're actually winning. They're, they're somehow bringing cryptanalytic capabilities online. They're actually attacking cryptographic systems at very large scale. They're passively decrypting TLS connections and IP, IPsec connections. We don't really know how they're doing it. We have some ideas, and we can start looking around and try to figure out what's happening. So we got this, this beautiful view into this whole different world and different perspective back in 2013, but we were left, I think, with more questions than answers. So this talk is going to take a different approach than some of the other talks, uh, including Nick's talk. The traditional talk about building crypto cryptographic systems or building any security system says, you know, how do we make these algorithms more secure in a world where the people who are building the algorithms are, are people, you're, people you trust? The implementers, the designers, and the developers are you. Or they're people who actually have your interest at heart. 
And we've, we've made a lot of progress in developing systems that work very well in that model. We've developed much more sophisticated and safer cryptographic algorithms. We've developed new algorithms that are secure against uh, side channel attacks. We've developed protocols like TLS 1.3. If you ask anybody, I've asked several people at this conference, like what is the biggest cryptographic output of the research community in the last few years? And they say TLS 1.3. So we've, we've solved TLS. We've made a very secure protocol that's been formally verified in a bunch of different ways and we think is not broken anymore. Uh, we've also really improved implementation and deployment. Uh, Nick's talk yesterday talked about how we're finally actually using all this encryption because computers are fast enough, because there's now economic motivation to encrypt things, so this is great. Uh, so all of this stuff is happening and it's very exciting. But all of this, this progress that we've made is based on one truly critical assumption, and that assumption is that the system designers are on our side. And so I want to talk about the possibility going forward what if they're not? What if they don't have our interests at heart? This idea of people finding different ways or finding a, a model in which um, the designers were not really um, trying to help us is not a new idea. It was actually first proposed in the early 1990s by a pair of cryptographers named uh, Modi Young and Adam Young, no relation. They uh, had this beautiful idea and they came up with this terrific uh, branding for it. Maybe that's a little little rough to call it branding, but this beautiful term, which is kleptography. Kleptography literally means the study of stealing cryptographic secrets securely and subliminally. It refers to an entire class of devices, algorithms, and systems that work against us by allowing insecure devices to basically steal our secrets, our randomness, whatever it is we need to do cryptography securely. And they went further than just defining this field. They wrote a couple of papers that actually proposed different ways to do this. Uh, one of their papers was um, defined this notion of a setup, which is an acronym, and I'll come back to what that means, but the idea here is that we can build cryptographic protocols that basically deliberately leak their secrets. So this, this unfortunately, this whole sort of area of science, well, it was, you know, published, conferences accepted the idea, it wasn't rejected, but for the most part, I think if you ask most people what they thought about the idea of kleptography as an actual threat back in the 90s, back in the early 2000s, do we have to care about this? They would basically say this is a conspiracy theory. Like there's no reason we should care about people, you know, backdooring our cryptographic devices. Like do you believe in, you know, Roswell? Like what is any of this stuff actually happening? It was, it was very unpopular and unfashionable to speak about this as though it was something that, you know, could happen. If you went on cryptography mailing lists and you looked at the cypherpunks, obviously they were terrified of this stuff happening, but nobody else cared. Now, if we move forward a little bit into the 1950s, uh, sorry, if we move back a little bit into history, we actually start to see that this is not so much of a crazy idea. These two gentlemen, anyone know who these two folks are that we're looking at here? Someone has to know. Okay, the person on the left, my left, is Boris Hagelin. Does that name ring any bells? I'll come back to who he is. And the person on the right is William Friedman, who is a very, very famous uh, US cryptographer who is one of the people who founded the Signals Intelligence Service during World War II and then ultimately went on to become basically the chief scientist or one of the chief scientists at the newly formed National Security Agency. So these are two very, very important people in our, our history. Uh, Boris Hagelin is sometimes referred to as the only person to have ever gotten rich on cryptography, um, before cryptocurrencies came along anyway. He, uh, he basically came in, he didn't invent rotor cipher machines, he took over a company in the 1920s in Sweden. This company manufactured kind of clunky, not particularly useful commercial rotor cipher machines. He went in, he redesigned most of these machines, and he actually made them commercially viable, and he started selling them to governments. This is in the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, Eventually, it got to the point where there was a lot of interest in using these, both by companies and increasingly by governments. Turned out in the 1930s, there were a lot of governments who had things they wanted to send securely, and they needed very efficient ways to do this over radio or telegraph. So these machines started selling. Uh, he developed contracts with France, um, several other countries, not Germany. Unfortunately, it turns out that when you have a contract with France and 1941 comes along, it's not a particularly good thing for your business, but he had a backup plan. And his backup plan was to get on a steamer in Genoa, Italy, and travel to the United States. He brought two of these cipher machines. You can see an example of one of them in this picture. 
in his luggage, this was two days before Italy entered the war on the side of the Axis. By the time he came back from uh, the US back to Europe, by the time it was safe to cross the Atlantic, he had licensed more than 200,000 of these machines, copies of these machines, built in New York City to the US government. They were called the M209. They were basically the universal army cipher machine. The Navy had a version, I think, but it was basically the most popular, the largest deployment of cryptographic machines ever up until that time. It also made this man very, very famous and very important to the US government. So when he went back to Europe and found out that Sweden wouldn't allow him to build machines and sell them to individual private companies, he moved to Switzerland and founded a new company which was called Crypto AG. Crypto AG has a very long and very checkered history. I'll start off with some of the things we know about it. And I'm gonna, this is where William Friedman comes in. In the 1950s, William Friedman was sent to Switzerland on behalf of the National Security Agency. And he was sent basically to propose an agreement with uh, Boris Hagelin. And we know this because after he died, his personal papers were donated to the George uh, C. Marshall Foundation. They were then sequestered by the National Security Agency in 1976. They briefly popped up, few people saw them. They were then sequestered again from 1983 onward and they were finally released in redacted form in 2015. Unfortunately, the redaction didn't go very well and multiple copies of the papers were released with different redactions. When you actually read these papers, there's this really amazing documentation of one of the first official efforts by the National Security Agency to subvert and, and basically undermine the security of commercial cryptography. One of the things we can read here, the text may be a little small, um, but basically the, it says that the idea was to make an approach to Mr. Hagelin, and it was authorized by USCIB, and it was concurred by LSIB. And the idea of this approach, and I'll go on a little bit further, was to identify certain models of Hagelin's machines that were extremely powerful and were believed hard for the National Security Agency at the time to break, and make sure those machines did not find their way into the hands of specific countries that the US didn't want to have access to strong crypto. So weaker crypto would be sold to certain countries, strong crypto would be sold to allies. Over time, this relationship developed into something much more formal and something much more powerful. Unfortunately, that led to the end of Crypto AG. If we fast forward to the 1980s, Crypto AG was selling machines all over the Middle East, and one of the companies, countries that was buying them was Iran. Um, in the 1980s, Iran suddenly arrested the uh, salesperson for Crypto AG and uh, put him in jail, demanded a $1 million bail. Crypto AG reluctantly paid this bail. The accusation was the machines were sabotaged. The salesperson denied this, but of course he didn't know anything about it. Crypto AG turned around and demanded that the salesperson reimburse them that $1 million, at which point he went to the press and so did a bunch of employees and began basically announcing that for years and years, Crypto AG had been collaborating with Western intelligence agencies to build in capabilities to their machine that would essentially exfiltrate session keys as part of the, the, the ciphertext message. None of these were confirmed until 2015 when we actually got evidence that this was happening. So this is hardly a surprising thing. We treat this as a conspiracy theory, but now we have really hard evidence that some of these things actually happened. One of the weird footnotes, and it's so weird I don't know if it's actually true, is that when Crypto AG's stock collapsed after these allegations came out, the, the person who came in and bought the company was uh, a, a billionaire who lived in Switzerland named Mark Rich. You probably know Mark Rich uh, from being pardoned by Clinton in the, the late, uh, the end of Clinton's term. So there's, there are these weird connections here. It's so strange, I don't know if that's, any of this is actually true. But um, definitely there was something going on here. There was, there's no, no way of denying that, that Crypto AG was compromised. And of course, we don't really have to wait until 2015 to find this out because in 2013, we got access to another document from the Snowden files which told us about a program called the SIGINT Enabling Project. The SIGINT Enabling Project is a $250 million per year project that is funded by the National Security Agency with a specific mission of inserting vulnerabilities into commercial encryption schemes, uh, IT systems, networks, endpoint communications devices used by targets, and also influencing policy standards and specification for commercial public key encryption schemes. So this is not a small project. This is a huge effort to undermine everything from public standards to actual implementations of crypto systems. Those up. One of the key aspects of this is that to the consumer and other adversaries, and this part is very critical, 
the system's security remains intact. I really want to highlight this. Is it possible to build crypto systems that are compromised to one party, the U.S. government, but cannot be compromised by any other adversary? This is the claim on which $250 million and a huge portion of U.S. cybersecurity is being laid. Is this possible? We'll see. Maybe it's possible, maybe it's not. So let's step back from these documents and talk about some of the different ways you can build kleptographic systems. Okay, so let's say you want to build a kleptographic system. Now, we, we saw one way to do this, which is you go to Boris Hagelin in 1950, you leverage your friendship, you get Boris Hagelin to put vulnerabilities into his hardware machines, and you sell them around the world. That's great if it's 1950, 1960, 1970, and 1980. It stops being so great when cryptography moves to the, the place that it is now, which is it's all software. How do you insert vulnerabilities into software that people can actually inspect in ways that will be standards compliant and other people can look at? So you can't mandate the hardware. Unfortunately, you can't even really mandate the protocols because a lot of these protocols are standard protocols. We use IPsec, we use TLS and SSL. We're stuck with those. You can't just design your own broken protocol. It would be nice if you could mandate the software from scratch, but that's a pretty big ask, going to companies and saying, do everything that I tell you to do. There are two things that you have the power to control if you're a government uh, and you have the uh, control of the standards agencies. So you can mandate specific cryptographic algorithms and moreover, you have the power to validate those cryptographic algorithms if you're in the position where you're actually offering um, certification of cryptographic systems. So these are the two sort of levers that you have to do what you need to do. When you start examining systems within those constraints, you come up with basically one place that's the perfect, perfect ingredient for backdooring any cryptographic system regardless of protocol, and that's the random number generator. So every single cryptographic protocol with maybe a very small number of exceptions devour random numbers. We need random number generators, either random number generators or pseudo-random number generators to produce enough bytes of randomness that we can actually execute a protocol. And this is not small. So every single TLS protocol between the, uh, just on the server side, consumes something like 108 bytes of randomness. And if that protocol does something like perform an ECDSA signature, any bias or flaw in that randomness or a recovery of that randomness completely dooms the private key of the server. It can be much worse. It can just harm the session, but it can also harm long-term keys. So you need extremely high quality, extremely unpredictable bits, and the attacker who can predict those bits is going to be able to break virtually everything with very, very few exceptions. And it gets worse because we trust our pseudo-random number generators so much, most systems will generate both secret values and public values from the same byte stream. And this is something we should take for granted because PRNGs should be secure this way, but in practice, it's very dangerous when they're not. So, for example, this diagram shows a series of blocks coming out of an RNG, and you can see on the left side we have at the very bottom a session ID for a TLS protocol, and that's going to be sent over the wire just in the clear. On the right side we see the server random, which is another nonce, which is going to be sent in the clear, and to, to the very right, we see the elliptic curve uh, Diffie-Hellman ephemeral secret key, which is an extremely important value for, with, you know, if somebody can get that value, the entire protocol is broken. But these are all coming from the same system. So how do you do this? How do you look at these PRNGs? What do they consist of? Ultimately, they break down into multiple parts. So there are different ways to build these. The classical random number generator is something we call a true random number generator. It's actually a probabilistic system. It's usually built out of hardware. Sometimes we use entropy collection on a system to collect this stuff. Um, we, we use the system. It's basically a randomized system. We can provide some standards for how this should work, but it's very difficult to come up with a universal backdoor that will work across all of these different hardware random number generators. But if you look at most standards for security, including the FIP standard, you see that it's not really acceptable most times to use the output of a true random number generator directly in protocols. Instead, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to take that output of the TRNG and feed it into a pseudo random number generator, and then you use the resulting bits to actually power your cryptographic protocols. And there's a reason for this. There are two reasons. The first is that TRNGs tend to be a little slow. And so we can't get a lot of bits out of them, so most protocols don't want to wait for enough bits to accumulate to actually operate. But secondly, and this is a very specific security uh, requirement, 
PRNGs are thought to have the power to basically overcome any biases or flaws that might occur in the hardware RNG. So we want to use the PRNG as kind of a additional security protection to make sure nothing bad happens to us if somebody compromises or if the TRNG malfunctions. So this is actually required by, for example, FIP standards. If we're going to target something, we're going to target the pseudo random number generator. When you dig into what the standardized pseudo random number generators look like down at the base level, they kind of break down into an algorithm that looks like this. It's a series of iterated applications of two different functions, which I'm going to call f and g. The seed comes in from the left side. That's the initial seed that we seed the PRNG from. That goes through some function f, which updates the state of the PRNG at each iteration. But of course, we can't just output that state because if somebody has the state, they can compute every future state of the generator. So we have to take that state and we feed it through a second function, which is called the G function. The G function is some kind of one-way function that processes the state into a new safe thing that we can now reveal to the world. Of course, it has to be the case that you can't go backwards through either, either of these functions. If you could go backward through the G function, you could take the output of the RNG, you could recover the state, and that would be terrible. If you can go backwards through the F function, that would allow you to basically rewind the state of a compromised generator, and you could go backwards into the past and see past RNG outputs. So if we're going to backdoor one of these things, we need to do one of two things. One proposal here is we can make the G function invertible. Now, what does that mean exactly? Obviously, if G is invertible to the whole world, the system is not secure. So maybe we can find some way to build a G function that anybody can evaluate forward, but only a person who has some specialized trapdoor, some secret key, can, can, can um, reverse. This would be really nice. It's possible. You could use some kind of one-way function or some kind of trapdoor one-way permutation to do this. We don't know of any systems, well, I'll come back to this, any public key systems that do this, so it's a little bit tricky. A second proposal is to do the following. What if you had some kind of mapping that could take the output of the G function and map it into something that is equivalent to the output of the F function? This would require some very specific algebraic G and F functions. It would be really weird if somebody built one of these into the standard. But if you had this trapdoor, you'd be able to do the conversion. This is the basic idea of this, this process. To see how this might work, we have to go back to the 90s. I'm going to show you a specific cryptographic protocol that was designed in the, in the setting of Schnorr signatures. This is from the Young and Young paper. This is a thing that they called a setup at the time. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this. What I want to point out here is that there is a single value in the signing process, which is called k. This is a random nonce. If the attacker knows the actual value of that random nonce that comes out of a signature, they can solve a very simple equation in order to get the private key of the signer. The entire scheme becomes insecure, therefore, if you can obtain k. So every implementation of Schnorr signatures, the same thing holds for ECDSA, has to be implemented such that K is protected and nobody can recover it. So it has to be not just unpredictable, but extremely high quality for a number of other reasons. What Young and Young proposed was really just a very simple extension to this. They said, what if we add to this algorithm a master key? The master key is this value up here, uh, G to the Y, with some secret Y. That's all we need. And let's assume that every implementation of the device contains only the public key, the master key, but the master secret key, that value Y, is only known to the attacker. Now, if two different, if, if, if a single signer produces two different signatures, and we assume that the signer is malicious, that they're trying to produce signatures that are backdoored, they can do the following. They produce the first signature in the standard way. They generate a random K, and they sign. The second signature generates K using a special algorithm. And basically what it does is it computes that master public key to the previous K and it hashes the result and you get K prime. And the beauty of this is that the person who has the private key Y, which we call them MSK here, can, given access to two different signatures, can compute the value K prime, the K for the second signature at any point, at which point they can recover the signing key and they can attack the entire system. And what's nice here is that somebody who only sees the signatures and doesn't know the implementation is doing this will have no idea that the system is backdoored. These look exactly like normal signatures. There's actually really, assuming a strong hash function, no way to distinguish the output of this in a black box way from something that's secure. So setups were kind of the first system to do this. Can we use setups to build an RNG that has the same properties? Well, think about it this way. 
let's say the initial seed comes into the f function. We're going to look at the kind of the state that comes out here in the middle as being some value x. And we're going to define the g function as just exponentiation. So g raised to the x. And we're going to define the f function as exponentiation with a different generator. So this value mk raised to the same x. Now it becomes obvious that anybody who knows the relationship between g and mk, which is to say the secret key generated here, can translate the output of the g function, this g to the x value, into the output of the f function mk to the x by doing a simple, uh, a single exponentiation. So it's really a sort of a trivial mapping from one scheme to the other. If you take this idea and you make two very simple changes, you replace the exponentiation with elliptic uh, point multiplication and you add just a little bit of truncation, you take off 16 bits of the output, the result is a generator that is actually a standard NIST generator called dual ECDRBG. It was standardized by NIST uh, in the document SP800-90A back in 2006. Um, it uses prime order elliptic curve subgroups, provides a bunch of different elliptic curves, and the vulnerability was actually found almost immediately by a pair of researchers from Microsoft named uh, Dan Shumo and Neil Ferguson. It was publicized, and of course, nobody believed it because why would the National Security Agency and NIST include a backdoor in a generator? This made no sense. Of course, there was an honest explanation for this. There could not possibly be something deliberate and malicious here. And so people who were paranoid about this, which included, say, Bruce Schneier, were looked at as nuts and conspiracy theorists and believing that something malicious happened here was sort of up there with believing in UFOs. It was not taken seriously until 2013. In 2013, uh, a series of memos came out from the Snowden documents that basically gave us extremely strong evidence that something malicious had taken place here. What we learned is not specifically that the NSA designed dual ECDRBG to be malicious, but we learned that in specific classified sections of their documents, they had discussed taking control of the standards process that led to the standardization of this particular random number generator and no other generators. And it made no sense. Why would they do that if there wasn't malice? The result of this was that ultimately NIST went back on its statement that the generator was secure. They withdrew the generator and they yanked it out of uh, production. So anybody who was using this generator as of December 2013 now had strong indication this was not a safe thing to use, that NIST no longer stood by it. They had to justify the continued use of this generator and why it would be safe to do so. Okay, so now I want to go back to this thing that I mentioned way, way back at the earlier part of this presentation, which is the idea of this backdooring is that we want to build systems that only the U.S. government can compromise, but the rest of the world believes they're secure. Is dual EC such a system? I'm actually curious. How many people believe that dual EC actually satisfies this? It's a public key-based random number generator. Presumably, only the NSA has the secret trapdoor that allows them to recover from it. If you use the standard parameters, you'd have to solve a elliptic curve discrete log problem instance in order to compromise the generator. It seems really good mathematically, right? Are we safe? This feels good? Okay, maybe, maybe not. Who knows? Are these things safe? Obviously, it seems like the NSA believed this was a safe approach. They put this into a lot of products that people used all over the world, including the U.S. government. So I want to fast forward to 2015, and I want to point out that some of this work that I'm going to talk about is joint work with uh, a whole group of other people, including Steve Checkaway, Nadia Henninger, and Hovav Shachem, other folks who are I'm not mentioning just because I don't think they're in this room and they're going to give me a hard time about it. Um, so I want to fast forward to 2015 when this incredible announcement came out of Juniper Systems. During a recent internal code review, Juniper discovered unauthorized code in ScreenOS that could allow a knowledgeable attacker to gain administrative access to NetScreen devices and to decrypt VPN connections. How could this possibly be? Now, this is a crazy vulnerability. There were actually two vulnerabilities in these Juniper devices. ScreenOS devices, by the way, are VPN and firewall devices that secure a huge percentage of US government agencies. So they're very important. What kind of vulnerability? <clears throat> what kind of hacker would break into Juniper's systems and install a vulnerability that basically just allowed them to passively break encryption? Now, breaking into somebody's code repository and installing like a password backdoor, that makes total sense. But an encryption backdoor implies that not only are you going to be breaking in and putting in this vulnerability, 
but you also have privileged network access. You can actually eavesdrop on connections sent between people using these VPNs. You can access this data and you're mathematically sophisticated enough to actually perform the decryption while keeping the de encrypted traffic looking enough like normal encrypted traffic that it appears to be unchanged. This is a very sophisticated vulnerability for somebody to insert. It makes no sense for a criminal hacking group to do. The only possible reason for this is probably some state-sponsored actor broke into Juniper Systems. So this is the actual CVE. It was CVE 2015-7756. It allows a knowledgeable attacker who can monitor VPN traffic to decrypt that traffic. Let's dig in a little further. If you look at the actual firmware images between the vulnerable and the patched uh, versions, immediately after this vulnerability came out, Juniper came out with a patch. There is shockingly little code that has changed. And when you look at the actual code that's changed, it comes down to this one constant here, this uh, value that was 9585 in the vulnerable version and is now 2C55 in the patched version. How can a single constant make a system go from insecure to secure? When you look closer at what that constant represents, you find out that it sits right next to a bunch of other values which turn out to be elliptic curve points. You can see here there's this P256 uh, virus strass B, there's this X coordinate, and there's this field order, followed immediately by the constants that differ between the different versions. When you look at those constants, it doesn't make a lot of sense. If you hypothesize that this is dual EC, you might go and look for the specific constant that NIST recommends in dual EC. But you wouldn't see that in any of this code. This is not dually C, at least using standard NIST constants. It's something different. When you dig a little bit further, you find out that actually this is still not dually C. It, it, it might make sense. Like this is some kind of attack on an implementation of dually C in Juniper systems, but Juniper doesn't use dually C. When you dig into their FIPS documentation, they list only one random number generator. It's called ANSI X9.31. It's an AES based random number generator. So what could possibly be happening here? Why would a single constant undermine the encryption of the entire system? It makes no sense. But thanks to Google, we can find documents that people don't necessarily want to have float to the top. And if you dig a few pages into the Google results, you find this particularly small note that came out in 2013. And what it says, this was published immediately after the Snowden revelations and after NIST withdrew Dual EC from certification. It gives a list of products that do and do not use the Dual EC random number generator that Juniper makes. The, product, the following product families do utilize Dual EC DRBG but do not use the predefined points cited by NIST. Screen OS. In the um, Footnote to this, it says ScreenOS does make use of the dual EC DRBG standard, but it is designed not to use dual EC DRBG as its primary random number generator. ScreenOS uses it in a way that shouldn't be vulnerable to the possible issue that's been brought to light. What does that mean? Like, how is it possible you have two random number generators, and how can you build this in such a way that there's no way to exploit dual EC, even if an attacker breaks into your code base, replaces the public key with a public key of their own? What exactly has, has Dual EC done? When you reverse engineer the code, you find the following. It turns out that at every point where random num numbers are used in the Dual EC code, what actually happens is a seed comes in from some entropy collector. It goes into the Dual EC DRBG random number generator. 32 bytes come out of that generator, the value K and V, and they go into a second generator, which is the only one announced in the FIP security policy for these devices. It's called ANSI X9.31. It's based on triple DES, actually, in this case. And then you get the output. In theory, the claim is that this approach should neutralize any backdoor that comes out of dual EC. Because even though somebody who recovers the output of dual EC could potentially reverse this and get the internal state of the random number generator using the approach we talked about before, once you post-process it with triple DES, it really seems like that should destroy the ability to run any attack here. So we're safe. We're not safe. We're not going to be safe at all. When you go further and you reverse engineer the code, you find this astonishing, amazing flaw. And the flaw looks like this. We have a routine called PRNG generate. PRNG generate basically goes out and it makes a subroutine call. Now I'm going to show you the subroutines at the very top. So the PRNG generates the bottom routine. It does some stuff, it initializes some variables, and then it calls this subroutine PRNG reseed. 
And PRNG reseed basically uses dual EC to place some values into a buffer. Subsequently, if we go back to the below that subroutine call, this buffer is post-processed using the ANSI generator. So dual EC is called, a buffer is filled, then post-processing happens in place. You should already see this is terrifying, right? We have like this dangerous data that somebody could use to exploit. It's in a buffer. We're gonna post-process it in place. And then we're gonna take the output of that buffer and we're gonna send it out to the world. So what's happening here? Clearly somebody made a very interesting mistake. What does that mistake look like? Well, if you look at this loop that happens directly below the call to the subroutine, it's a for loop. And like every good C programmer, you start out by using, you know, a global variable as your loop counter. No, you don't do that. That's completely insane. Why would you use a global variable as your loop counter? That's nuts. What actually happens here is the for loop has a global variable. It doesn't initialize properly at the start of the for loop. The initialization, the actual counter is this variable called PRNG output index. That got initialized, let me see if I have it. Oh, I don't. That got initialized on line 15. So it happened before the subroutine call. So why would that possibly lead to problems? Well, at line 15, we have the initialization. At line 18, we have a subroutine call. Is it possible that that global variable is being altered in the subroutine? Of course, we find out that it is. The global loop counter is being set to 32 in the subroutine, the effect of which is that this entire subloop never runs, which means that whatever dual EC value is put into this buffer is exactly the value that will go out. This is like the most astonishing vulnerability that I've ever seen. I would pay any amount of money to see the actual source code that did this. I don't know if this was like the world's dumbest C variable naming mistake or if it's something else, but like I just cannot imagine how this happened. The end result is that we have dangerous values going out. The entire ANSI generator simply doesn't get called and the result is that there's now an attack on dual EC if you have the secret key. But there's more. When you look at these protocols, there are other changes. If you look at the first version of the screen off system that has dual EC in it, you notice that there were some other changes made at the same time dual EC was added. In the original versions of screen OS, before dual EC was added, there were nonces. There are always nonces. This is, uh, we're talking about the IPsec protocol. So any protocol like IPsec or TLS has nonces that go in the clear. In order to execute an attack, the idea here is we want to see some raw output of the dual EC DRBG protocol. So we want to see a nonce. We want to use that to recover the generator state. And then we want to be able to predict secrets like private keys. Unfortunately, that would not have been possible in the design of the screen OS system that was common in version 6.1. The nonces that were released in that system were 20 bytes long. In order to exploit dual EC, you need to get 30 to 32 bytes of output. So coincidentally, in the same version of screen OS in which dual EC was added as this undocumented random number generator, we see the increase in non size that goes to about 32 bytes. So this is problematic. So now we see there are other changes that kind of go with dual EC. The other thing you'd, wanna, you'd want to see in a uh, vulnerable system is that the first thing that would happen is that the system generates a nonce using the random number generator, outputs that nonce, and then subsequently generates a secret. Because that means if you see the nonce, you can go back and obtain the state of the generator and wind forward to get the secret if you're an attacker. But dual EC doesn't seem to, uh, sorry, screen OS doesn't seem to do this. It does things in the op opposite order. It generates a Diffie-Hellman secret key, and then subsequently in the code, it generates the nonce. This would seem to stop the attack. There's no reason that you should actually have a, a key recovery attack because the person who sees the nonce won't be able to go back in time and see the Diffie-Hellman secret key. Except it turns out that in screen OS 6.2, which is also the version that adds dual EC, there's another very subtle change to the code. What it does is it adds a new thing called a nonce pre-generation queue. It means that any nonces that are generated by the system are generated prior to the actual execution of, let's say, an IPsec handshake. They're generated early and they're stuck into RAM. And it turns out that the way this actually works is it guarantees that each nonce is generated immediately prior to the generation of a Diffie-Hellman secret. This seems almost tailor-made to ensure that you now have a key recovery attack that you would not have had 
in the previous version. So this is an, another very strange and mysterious change that doesn't make a lot of sense, but enables exploitation. Without this specific change, exploitation would not be possible. Okay, so I want to kind of go back and I want to show a timeline. We have this timeline that begins, I've talked about, I'm skipping all the Hagelin stuff, but in 1996, Young and Young proposed this idea of setups. From his, historical documents, we know that about 1998, the NSA starts inventing a new random number generator that uses elliptic curves. They call it dual ECDRBG. They push it into the NIST standards. It, uh, the full on standardization process begins way later in about 2004. And in 2007, there's a final NIST standard that includes dual ECDRBG. In 2008, Juniper begins adopting dual EC directly into its system in an undocumented fashion. It's now included in, dual EC, in, in all screen OS devices. In 2012, there's this screen OS code hack in which hackers get into, Dooley, into Juniper's code and they modify the public key to make it vulnerable. So four years go by. The hack is discovered in late 2015. What this means is we have this kind of interesting looking vulnerability window with two colors. The yellow is the time during which whoever made this implementation of Dooley C and put it into Juniper's screen OS could have been able to exploit any screen OS VPN connection. Now, we don't know who that was. Was this the US government? Was this someone at screen OS? Was this also yet another hacker? We're not sure. The red represents the time period during which we know that some outside hacking group, which is currently believed to be China, but nobody knows for sure, actually had full access to decrypt every VPN connection made by a screen OS device, which is a huge number of screen OS devices. And nobody discovered this until late 2015 when it was suddenly changed. So there's this huge vulnerability window, dual vulnerability window, and we're not sure what any of it means and what was attacked here. Okay, so I want to just step back to the, maybe this is all a conspiracy theory thing. I don't know the answers to these questions, but I think these are questions we should get the answers to. So clearly, Juniper was not the end target of this hack. Juniper was a victim in some sense, or maybe Juniper was somehow collaborating in the original backdoor, but was then targeted by the, the people who hacked into their code and replaced their public keys. So who was the target? We have to think about that a little bit. You could ask the FBI, uh, which I did this summer, and you get back this response, which says, sorry, there's an ongoing investigation. We can't tell you anything. Apparently, it's not a very productive investigation because it's been, uh, you know, three years and change, so not, not working very well. You could go around and you could look for some of the major, very high-profile U.S. government hacks, and you could see if they were using screen OS devices, and Hovav uh, Shockham actually uncovered this amazing uh, Excel spreadsheet, which gives, in 2013, the serial number and model number of every screen OS device at the Office of Personnel Management, which apparently was entirely run using screen OS devices and VPNs from multiple sites. So anytime somebody needed to verify, for example, that you know, a particular government employee had a background check done, they would use this VPN. They would use a screen OS VPN, sometimes from other countries, to make a connection back to OPM headquarters which meant that anybody with privileged network access would have had access potentially to credentials. Now, we have no idea if OPM was, was actually related to the Juniper hack. It's really interesting the timeline lines up, but that's all we know. Again, I said this is all conspiracy theory stuff. We don't know. There is a question which I think could be answered, which is these hackers did this for a reason. They got into these systems. They made changes specifically to a VPN system so it would become vulnerable to passive eavesdropping. This means that they had some kind of position where they could actually eavesdrop on VPNs. We can assume they weren't the US government because the US government already had their potentially own backdoor inside of screen OS. So this is some outside party. How would they get access to large amounts of network traffic potentially inside the US? We could start looking for incidents in which network traffic was rerouted globally and we could see if there was an uptick in incidents that happened maybe because of BGP hijacking in this time period, which is about late 2012 to 2015. Again, it doesn't mean anything, but it turns out that prior to about January or February 2013, there were almost no incidences of bi-directional man-in-the-middle BGP hijacks where information was actually hijacked out of the United States, sent overseas, and then brought back through a different path. In fact, I think there were none. There were many BGP misconfiguration issues in which BGP just stopped working. But in early 2013, a new pattern emerged where a bunch of connections from all over the US and all over the world 
began being routed to places like Belarus and Belarus and to um, and to Iceland, but then mysteriously began coming back in in meaning that anyone who was actually looking at these connections would not know that there was a problem. They would not know that their their traffic was going overseas. And these stepped up and became very common in 2013, 2014. Again, who was doing this? We don't know. Uh, there's at least one Icelandic uh, ISP that says it was a misconfiguration issue and has refused to talk about it since. Uh, we don't know what most of the others are doing, but this has become much more common. So we know that network traffic is vulnerable. We just don't know who's doing this. Okay. I want to sort of, again, this whole whole presentation is kind of a conspiracy theory, but I want to, since we're going way, way out on a plank, let's, let's talk about some other things. So let's assume that dual EC was something that people did on purpose. It was a deliberate targeting of systems by the U.S. government. And let's assume that there does exist a policy to promote vulnerabilities in VPN systems. I don't think we have to assume much. We saw the document. We saw the budget for that system. How would you implement these kind of attacks prior to the existence of dual EC and these public key RNGs. The most popular random number generator before NIST standardized dual EC was this. It's called ANSI-X 9.31. We saw it referenced earlier. It's an AES or triple DES based random number generator and it's very simple. It involves uh, on the left side there's an update function which uses a fixed key K. On the right side there's an output function which also uses a fixed key K. Uh, the idea here is that you have a seed and you have a fixed key the fixed key is incredibly important that that fixed key is never leaked because if that fixed key is leaked, terrible, terrible, terrible things happen. This is a very old and well-known vulnerability, which is an attacker who knows the fixed AES key or the fixed cipher key for the cipher can, given any 16 bytes of output, recover the internal state of the RNG and they can attack anything. So it might be interesting to look and see how people are managing that key. It should be randomly generated. If we go out and look at FIPS documents, we'll find out that it is, right? Except when you start going through FIPS documentation, you see stuff like this. You see that that key K, the critical key on which the entire security of this random number generator rests, is hard-coded into the code of a number of VPN devices. This is actually, I think, a um, FortiGate VPN. This is the second most popular VPN system, hardware system in the U.S. Uh, at the t in prior to 2015. So if we know that this key is hard-coded into code, is it exploitable? So with Shannon Coney and Nadia Henninger, we actually looked at this code. We found that key in the hardware. It's been there for several years. And we tried to implement a reverse engineering attack to see if we could actually do recovery and we could actually do state recovery. We found that it's really interesting. The way this generator works is there's a timer. And the timer is actually fed into the entropy of the system. In order to attack the system, you have to know the exact time that the random number generator was executed. If that timer has very high granularity, it can take something like 2 to the 40 or 2 to the 50 tests in order to recover the actual internal state of the RNG. So by adjusting this timer, you don't get something that is a uh, backdoor that only the person who knows the secret key can exploit, but it is very computationally expensive to exploit. It's an exploitable system where you can increase the cost of exploitation arbitrarily high by adjusting that timer. And we were able to actually execute this attack on real Fortinet devices. Uh, unfortunately, it's just, it's just an incredibly expensive thing to do, and maybe 10 years ago it would have been possible to actually backdoor a system using this and not have any attacker be able to attack it, but only somebody with a lot of computation power could have done this. So you can actually build systems that are sort of hard for others to attack. So to sum up all of these results, we have this era where there are these catastrophic random number generator vulnerabilities in the two leading VPN device manufacturers during essentially the same time period, which means that anybody who was buying this hardware in order to secure their systems was completely vulnerable, either vulnerable to maybe a U.S. government attack or a foreign attack. You could look at this in two possible ways. One is you could use Hanlon's razor, which is never attribute to malice, that which can be adequately explained by stupidity. So maybe this was all a terrible mistake. The other way you can look at this is apply Heinlein's razor, which is never attribute to malice, that which can be adequately explained by stupidity. But don't rule out malice. We know that people are trying to harm these systems. When we see evidence that they're being harmed, we should take it seriously and we should ask questions about how we verify the security of those. So I guess the, the hard question, the part that I am avoiding as much as possible, 
is how do we fix this? So we know that somebody is putting bugs in systems and these people are the most privileged people in the sense that they build the system and we can't really stop them from doing this. How do we make cryptography we can trust in this incredibly difficult setting? Um, it's very, very difficult. I mean, at the end of the day, there's almost nothing you can do. You can ultimately, if you have full control of the code, build a system that exfiltrates any private key in almost any way you can imagine, either using random numbers or timing or just about anything. So if the adversary is fully capable, you're in just terrible trouble. There's nothing you can do. But in practice, adversaries are constrained by a couple of factors. One is that they have to limit the complexity of the modifications they make. They can't make systems arbitrarily malicious. They have to make small changes to code. Those small changes, like the one we saw in the dual EC code, are what allows this to sort of fly under the radar of reviewers and other people who aren't in on the conspiracy. So this is kind of why RNG, corrupted RNG designs seem to be so popular, at least in terms of the things we see. One answer to how do we prevent this is we try to build protocols that are just fundamentally more resilient. So let me give you a, an example of how we could do this. It's very weak. The original Ike protocol, which is the internet key exchange protocol, uses a pre-shared key as one of the ways you can authenticate. The way in Ike v1 that, that pre-shared key is actually integrated into the system is it's hashed into the key derivation function that derives the symmetric key that you will use to actually encrypt data. This means even if the Diffie-Hellman is completely broken and an attacker can recover all of the private keys for that channel, if they don't have the PS key, they still won't be able to decrypt data. So Ike v1 sort of inadvertently has this additional security property. It's not very strong, but it's something if you have a good pre-shared key. Unfortunately, in Ike v2, the design was changed. In Ike v2, the pre-shared key is not fed into the key derivation function. It's used as a MAC. And so this means that Ike v2 in the setting where somebody has actually recovered your internal entropy is completely insecure even if the adversary can't recover your high entropy PSK. PSK. So some protocols can survive this and some can't. The other thing we could try to do is we could replace FIPS validation with something better. I mean, one of the things we're learning over time is that this idea of FIPS is the Federal Information Processing Standards. It's the, basically the gold standard for how we make sure cryptographic devices are secure. We're learning that FIPS validation doesn't work very well. For example, it's possible to sneak an entire new random number gener generator that's undocumented into a major product, and the FIPS validation people won't say boo about it. So this is not something that's happening very well. Um, FIPS doesn't seem to catch vulnerabilities. It's basically a bunch of algorithm tests plus a bunch of compliance documents. And on top of that, the amazing thing that we found is that when we looked at Fortinet and we looked at that hard-coded key that they'd put into their random number generator, it was actually a FIPS algorithm testing key that they'd left in their code. And so FIPS in some cases can actually make things less secure by requiring people to add extra code to their devices for testing purposes that makes that code less secure. So is there something we can do to make that better? Um, maybe we can find better ways to do whole protocol evaluation. We can validate devices by speaking to them in their language and then having them prove that the output of a transcript is actually a valid transcript. They did the cryptography correctly with real random numbers. Is that something we can do? It's not clear, but this would be a good direction for very strong validation rather than doing these kind of algorithm tests that we don't know if they work. Another approach is maybe we just use formal validation on everything. I'm laughing at this idea because I spent a year trying to validate one component of this ANSI X9.31 generator using the COC tool. It was the most unpleasant year of my life, and it's definitely not going to scale to any cryptography more, more sophisticated than this. But, you know, eventually maybe we'll find a way to build code that is, you know, formally val validated. We can actually build things that are safe. I'm, I'm skeptical. And the last thing is maybe we should just give up on trusting systems entirely. I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of our hardware gets manufactured overseas. We should just start to look at it as adversarial. What does that mean? Well, it means we have to design around components that we don't trust. Not really possible to do that if there's nothing we trust. So maybe we try to find portions of the, the system that we can trust and we bootstrap security into all of that untrusted stuff from there. We build a small secure enclave processor inside of every device that can basically be our root of trust and all of the cryptography can hap happen elsewhere, but we can use that little point of trust to make the rest of the device safe. It's possible. There are some work that does this. It's very theoretical. Uh, in fact, one of my SATSE grants is on this subject. And so this is a really interesting area. Maybe we can do this reducing trust, not eliminating it. 
The point I want to make at the end of this is that this is a real threat model. It's something that should actually drive our research. Because whether you believe that the US government is out here to backdoor all of our crypto, or you believe that foreign adversaries are going to do it, somebody is going to do it. It has now been proven to be an effective tool and one that people just don't find. So we, in order to have any influence on the security of anything in the world, we need to be thinking about this threat model. We need to be thinking about how to stop it. And we need to be thinking about how to take those ideas into practice. That's basically the, the summary of all of this. Um, I'm really hopeful because I've seen some very, very good work by people in this community on this. I'm sad that it seems like most of this work is dying away as the Snowden revelations kind of recede into the past. And I would like to see whether there are sort of stronger um, approaches that, that we've missed and something we could do uh, to make these systems secure. And so that's all. Thank you very much.